evening. Good evening. I greet you with my love and respect. It's a great privilege to be uh, speaking uh, at Riverview Church. This uh, church has really had an influence on my life when I came to the city 24 years ago. I uh, was a great friend with uh, Pastor Phil Baker and just the embracive way Riverview uh, just uh, took me in and, uh, you know, uh, the church I was pastoring at that time 24 years ago was quite small. But I learned so much from, from this church, so uh, that was uh, really valuable. Yeah, Sally, as, um, as you heard, can't be here. Uh, she's visiting her mum in Queensland. But if she was here, she'd be telling me, David, don't preach too quickly. Let them vibe you out first. <laughs> because nobody's really listening to you the first couple of minutes. They're vibing you, man. They're... Sneakers, I don't know, should he have done that with those white sneakers? I guess he's got a T-shirt on, fair enough. And then, you know, hair, well, last time I saw him, he had a lot more hair than this, and da-da-da, and it's all going on. So while you're doing that, I'm going to ask you to vibe quickly, okay? <laughs> so I've got a bit of ground to cover. Uh, but I've got actually two titles for my sermon tonight. One hand, I could call this message Seasons. Or... Don't cut down your peach tree in wintertime, all right? So how many of you are going to go for seasons? How many of you are going to go for don't chop down your peach tree? Okay. How many wouldn't lift your hand no matter what I said? All right. There's a couple of you. There always is in every crowd. We're got. we going to go with don't cut down your peach tree in wintertime. And by the time I get through this evening you'll understand where that's coming from. Okay, vibing over. <clears throat> that's all you're going to get. We're going to pray now and uh, get into it. So Lord, thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in this room right now. More than just another sermon, but a word from you. I pray in Jesus' name, veils lifting off the hearts of our eyes right now to see more clearly in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so don't cut, don't do it. Turn to the person next to you and say, don't cut down that peach tree in wintertime. Don't do it. All right. Okay, <clears throat> so here's where we're going to begin. Psalm 23, many of you know this psalm. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. And then he begins to unpack what's already in the first line. He's really just describing what it means to have the Lord as your shepherd. Uh, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This psalm has brought comfort to thousands and thousands of people uh, throughout the years. And I think it speaks to the haunting orphan spirit that often lingers around a human soul that I'm in this world alone but this this psalm is actually speaking deeply within the human soul letting them know that they've actually got a God that's looking out for them. Now uh, many of us have read this psalm it's got great uh, thoughts in it but to a Jewish person this psalm is actually talking about the love of God. It is, in fact, a description of how God loves you. It's great to say God loves you, but when you've got to understand that when the Bible's telling you that, it's not describing an emotion. It's describing a behavior. It's actually telling you, when, when the Bible says God loves you, it's telling you, I will faithfully behave in a certain way towards you. And we see that depicted in the psalm. It's in the same way that the shepherd would guide, provide, and protect the sheep. When God is guiding you, providing for you, and protecting you, that is 
agape love. That's love in action. That's the behaviour of love. And so I think that's why uh, we feel something deep within our soul when we hear the words of this psalm. It's actually the embrace of God in that moment. And so often when we think of our future, we go into anxiety because, wow, there's so many unknown quantities there and we end up with a heart full of anxiety. But this psalm is telling you all you need to know about your future is God's going to be in it. That's all you need to know. That this shepherd, you just need to put your hand in his hand and he's going to be there guiding, providing and protecting for you. So next time you're tempted to jump into your future and get a heart full of anxiety, just to, hang on. I am not in this world alone. I'm not an orphan. I have a shepherd. I'm going to live a shepherded life. The shepherd will guide, provide and protect whenever I get there uh, in the future. But there's something else in this psalm that I really want you to see. And that did you notice that here we are following this shepherd. He's taking us through to green pastures, still waters, but he's also taking us into valleys. And he's also having us eating at banqueting tables in the presence of our enemies. And so there's a whole spectrum of life experiences that are incorporated in you living a shepherded life. Stop thinking that when things are, are not smooth as silk for you, that somehow God stopped loving you or that you're outside of the will of God. I don't know where we got this idea that being in the will of God means problem-free existence. Try telling it to Jesus. Try telling it to Paul and all the apostles who, by the way, were martyred. All right, don't worry, it's going to be a smooth ride from here. I don't know where we got that from. So in this psalm even, we're seeing here we are living the shepherded life, following the shepherd, and yet it's taking us through a whole spectrum of experiences, valleys, enemies, challenges to overcome, etc. and so on. And so we discover something. Da -na -na -na. I come with my own sound effects to actually help you know when I'm making an important point, you know. Um, so this is one of them. God is not leading us through life for our comfort, but for our maturity and fruitfulness, all right? So that's what this psalm is expressing, not this smooth ride of comfort living this shepherded life, but one that's going to bring us into maturity and fruitfulness. And so that's where I get this whole thought uh, of God taking you through a cycle of seasons. The, you know, summer, winter, autumn, spring, they're all seasons. God has ordained seasons. Why? To ensure a continual cycle of renewal. On and on and on it goes. And so I'm saying that actually nature speaks to you of how God's dealings in your life are meant to go. We're told this in uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 that creation is a revelation of the creator. If you want to understand the creator, it's his, his character, his wisdom and his ways is actually revealed in the way that he's made creation to work and creation has a continual cycle of renewal uh, built into it through the four seasons. And so I'm saying uh, that's telling us of how God works in our lives. He works in various uh, expressions and the Bible has a, um, a way of talking or uh, wanting us to recognize these seasons. It's very important that we recognize them. And it refers to them as specific times. Uh, not clock time, but Kairos time. Now, in the 11 o'clock, there was a Greek gentleman who came up to me and he corrected me of my pronunciation of the Greek word Kairos. He said, No, it's Kairos. And I said, so it's Kairos. And he said, no. It's, and, I, and I thought, 
Hang on, I'm saying what you're saying, but he insisted I was getting it wrong every time. But anyway, thank you, George. I'm trying, okay? <laughs> All right. So George might have come back tonight to see if he's going to get it in the five o'clock. No, I think I just failed again. But look, it's kairos time, and it simply means in the Greek language, not clock time, but season time, windows of opportunity, times when certain things are available that are not always going to be available. And so that's called, uh, when God is working in a particular way in your life in a particular time, Kairos time, that's a, that's a season that you need to identify. Is this winter, summer, spring? It says in uh, Ecclesiastes 3.1, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. It says of some of David's mighty men that they understood the times and in response to their discernment of the time, they knew what they should do. All right. Uh, Jesus, speaking to his brothers, used the word kairos and he said, uh, you go to the feast, I am not going to go up to the feast yet because for me the right time has not yet come. So this is a very a critical word that helps us understand how God works in seasons in your life. Let me uh, drill down a little bit more to make sure you've got what kairos time is and the importance of it. I was present at the birth of all seven of my children. Yep. And uh, so it sort of went similar nearly every time. <laughs> but my wife would be examined and they'd say, look, now's not the time to exert yourself. All right. Uh, wait. All right, so they'd examine her and then they'd tell her when the right time because all of her effort would be wasted if she didn't get in sync with the time. All right, so we hear this thought of, of the timing or the seasons of God when... when uh, Mordecai I referred to his uh, to Esther and said, "You were born for such a time as this." He wasn't, you know, looking at his sundial watch and going, "Oh yeah, it's time." He was referring to this particular moment in history, and even now, as we look back through history, we can see certain leaders appeared or stepped forward onto the stage of history to contribute something and then they were withdrawn from the stage of history. Mahatma Gandhi, if he rocked up tomorrow in India, he would have nowhere near the success that he had back in that particular time. Uh, Winston Churchill, uh, uh, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, these were all, all leaders that we needed on the platform of history at a particular Kairos moment. They were the right person in the right place doing the right thing. And, and then they were withdrawn from the stage of history. The, psalm and under, the psalmist understood this when he said in Psalm 31, But I trust you, O Lord, and I say you, my God, my times are in your hands. So it's so important that we, uh, like the sons of Issachar, we can work out what Season. What is the Kairos moment? What's, what's God doing right now? Because you can do the right thing at the wrong time and waste all your effort. I'm going to say that again for people here tonight. You can do the right thing at the wrong time. Right now you could be doing the right thing, but you haven't discerned the right moment and so your efforts are wasted. We need to recognize it and move with it. Jesus was referring to a Kairos moment where he would he shifted his emphasis from one area of, of evangelism with his disciples to another. And it would have sounded so confusing to them, but it was a Kairos moment. It was a shift of seasons, as, uh, so to speak. And here it is in, in Luke uh, 22. Uh, he's speaking to them and he says, When I sent you without purse, bag or sandals, did you lack anything? 
Nothing, they said. So, yeah, they're going, it was successful. The method you gave us was successful. And then he says, but now. That's it. That's a moment. But now, listen to what he says. He's shifting. There's another shift in a Kairos moment. But now, if you have a purse, take it. And also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Well, how confusing is this? Is this Jesus changing his mind? Is this him doing his, a backflip? How, how inconvenient. I mean, they'd set up all their follow-up programs and their glossy manuals and their 10 steps program. Don't take a bag or a purse and all this. And it's a drummed into all, you know, the, the crew and the volunteers. And now Jesus said, yeah, I know I said that. But now I want you to do the complete opposite of that. How are we going to explain this to everybody? They're thinking, man, alive. All right. Now, it wasn't that Jesus was changing his mind. It was actually him going, because you were obedient to do that, we can now do this. He wasn't flushing it to the side and saying, well, that was all just a waste of time. He was saying, on the platform and foundation of your previous obedience, I can now do this. That's actually what Jesus was not discarding the past. He was honoring it by now being able to introduce this next phase that he was taking them into. And so it's just so, imagine if they'd just refused to accept that Kairos moment and said, Jesus is just having a bad day. See, see, often we get it right, God speaks and he shows us something and it's true and it's right, but what we don't realise is it's the right thing to do in that Kairos moment. It's not meant to be enshrined as if on some untouchable sacred thing, never to be altered. It's just the now moment of how things uh, should be done that Jesus is giving us. So we can do the right thing at the wrong time. When we don't understand seasons, we can try and project ourselves into something that God doesn't want us to have at that time. Again, if you don't work and understand the fact that there are seasons, kairos moments, you're going to try and project yourself into something that God doesn't want you to have. So you are building expectations for something that God is not going to release to you yet. So you're destined to be frustrated and disappointed, maybe even questioning God's faithfulness and his love for you. But it's simply because you haven't taken the time to understand the Kairos moment. You know, Abraham, we all know the story of Abraham. Many of us, he had a promise from God that he was going to have a son. Well, he just got impatient waiting for that promise. So he forced the moment. He expected fruit in a winter, if you like. And so he forced it. And if you know the story, instead of having the son of promise, um, uh, he actually had an Ishmael. And even today we see the ramifications of him getting out of step with the rhythm of God. Because the descendants of Ishmael are the Arab nations. And so now in the Middle East, the conflict, ongoing conflict between the Jewish people, the, son, the children of promise with the children of Ishmael is an ongoing repercussion of uh, getting out of step with these Kairos moments uh, that God is uh, bringing to us. So... If you are sitting here thinking that you want your life to go through springtime all the time, you need to wake up and get a real life. <laughs> all right, because that's not a real life. Springtime all the time is not a real life. Your life is going to, real life has seasons in it. Jesus said, listen, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And when you're fruitful, I'm going to prune you. Yeah, well, actually the Father will, but nonetheless, that's what, why that? Why would the reward for fruitfulness be pruning? Because God is working in your life 
in seasons and he's ensuring a continual cycle of uh, fruitfulness uh, in your life. So I know that when I talk about seasons, lots of people don't get it. They think I'm being incredibly negative talking about winter, you know, um, and, you know, the, the, the letting go of autumn and the fruitlessness of winter that we just need to accept. And how negative. Well, they say, well, God is good all the time. And I say, yes, he is. Even in winter, he's good. Even in autumn, he's good. I'm not asking you to accept anything that's contrary to the character of God. I'm not up here suggesting you need to accept disease or depression or despair. I'm saying you need to accept that there's this continual cycle of uh, renewal going on in your life. And the Bible warns us that we're just foolish if we think that this does not apply to us. It says, uh, Galatians 6, 7, do not be fooled. You cannot cheat God. Uh, People harvest only what they plant. All right, so now I'm coming to a moment in my message that I call my tough love moment. Is that okay? So I'm going to speak to you now. I'm going to put my arm around you figuratively, but I'm going to speak some tough love to you. Because what we've got here is a confusion we need to clear up about you making bad choices and reaping the repercussions of those bad choices and not confusing that with uh, what I'm talking about seasons. So I'm going to take a moment to separate those two. You know, for you to say, I was dismissed in my job because I was rude to my boss perpetually. I turned up late every day and God's taking me through a winter season right now. (laughs) No, you're a yobbo plonker and you got the sack. (laughs) That's what happened. Right, You made some bad choices and now these are the consequences of those choices. This is not seasonal stuff. I was driving down the freeway, eating my lunch, texting my friend and fiddling with you know something on my dashboard and I crashed my car. Winter, winter. No, you're a yobbo plonker. That's, you just, you made some bad choices and now you're dealing with the consequence of it. So now this is, this is me. Now, lots of people, when I talk like in these tough love moments, they think, boy, he's not a very compassionate pastor. I'm so glad we don't sit under his ministry. But listen, I have busted my fufu valve for 40 years trying to help people with their marriage, finances, and families uh, while they continue to make bad lifestyle choices. I'm busting my fufu, and I'll leave that to you to work out where the fufu valve exists in the human anatomy. But I've had it patched up that many times trying to work with people. So listen, just humor me while I vent a little bit, all right? I mean, people come out uh, asking for prayer and they say, Pastor, suddenly my wife has left me. No, not suddenly. Suddenly, no. You've been sowing bad, you've been treating her so badly all these years. You don't say suddenly. Buddy, go home and start sowing some decent seed into your marriage if you want to turn it around. Pastor, pray. Suddenly, I have a major assignment due in my university uh, tomorrow. (laughs) No, it's called a planner. You got it at the beginning of the year. All right? Suddenly, I'm in major uh, visa card debt. No, it's called a budget. It's got all a budget and, you know, you've been handing over the plastic a little too much. You know, not suddenly, all right? You know, the farmer doesn't say, suddenly I have a harvest of corn. I, I thought it's like, suddenly. No, no, this is the result of making choices. And so please, I'm venting now, I'm venting. It's good for me. This is me getting therapy here. It's, it's all right. But... Let's not confuse a gift that God gives freely by grace and love and mercy with fruit. They're two different things. Sometimes we're actually asking God to give as a gift what he's already said. No, that's not a gift. That's a fruit. A good marriage is not a gift. It's a fruit. Passing uni really well with high grades is not a gift. I can't sort of lay hands on you. There it is. Receive. Straight A's all the way. Oh, my God. 
<laughs> it's not going to happen. I mean, I could do it, mess up your hair and shout a little bit, juggler vein sticking out, and you're impressed. But listen, you're just going to have to go home and study, all right? It's just, all that's just going to have happen. Graduating, a successful career. Lay hands on me. I want to play the keyboard. Well, go home and practice. It's like, oh, my goodness. We want as a gift what is actually a fruit. All right. I feel better now. Oh, that was me getting that off my chest. All right. So three points now uh, that I want you to remember about seasons. All right. You ready? Now, when I speak in Singapore, when I say point number one, the people go, oh. They write it down very quickly. Could you hear me? Because I haven't travelled so much that lately. I'd really like you to just. When I say point number one, I want you to go. <sighs> you ready? Point number one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's too better. Yeah. I miss my Singaporean friends. Point number one. Oh, jeez. You've forgotten already. Let's try. <laughs> try it already. At least try. Point number one. Oh. With enthusiasm, they're saying it because they're, wow, point. You, you can't preach there without points. See, so if you're not preaching with points, that wasn't a sermon. You know, you have to have points. So point number one, understand. Yes, that's right. Understand that God is at work in every season, so learn from whatever season you're in. He, uh, Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, or however cook you want to cook it, all right, <laughs> Though the fig tree does not blossom, no fruit on the vines, the fields yield no fruit. In other words, no matter what season I'm going through, I will rejoice in the Lord. So God is at work in every season. So learn from whatever season you're in. You know, sometimes things happen and we think, oh my goodness, what possible good can come of this? But I've learned something about things that happen. There's the pain that you go through when it happens, but then there's the pain that you perpetuate by the meaning that you've given to the happening. So a lot of the the pain is perpetuated not by the happening, but by the meaning that you keep revisiting and giving to. So don't do that. Realize that God is at work in every season. So look for where, well, Lord, what are you teaching me here? What's the lesson that I'm meant to be learning? <clears throat> the children of Israel, Deuteronomy 8 uh, it says, remember how the Lord your God has led you in the desert for 40 years, taking away your pride and testing you. That's what it was about. Uh, because he wanted to know what was in your heart. So winter, spring, summer, uh, and the one I've forgotten uh, is in there. Uh, God's at work in all of them, you know. So isn't it amazing how everybody wants to be an overcomer, but they don't want anything to overcome? You know, have you noticed that? Uh, I want to be an overcomer. It doesn't happen by you singing about it or reading about it. God's at work in every season. So if challenges are coming, that's your opportunity to become someone. You're becoming an overcomer in that moment. So realize every moment God's at work in whatever season. So I'm looking for the life lesson in every season. Number two. Gee. Number two. Uh, yeah. <sighs> now it goes. <sighs> That's actually how it goes. <sighs> so a season is simply where you are, not who you are. <sighs> A season is simply where you are and not who you are. In other words, you can go through winter and you're not a bad person. It's not a reflection of you as a person. You're just living like a human on the planet. If you're going through winter, welcome to the planet. Welcome to the human life. We're not going to look at you and go, oh, what have you been doing going through that autumn season. Listen, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. 
Check it out. So what are we going to do? Look at him getting tempted, going into the world and saying, well, Jesus, what have you been doing? You know, what are you, what's going on, man? No, it's simply where you are, not who you are. It's just the way God's actually working in your life. So can we just respect the fact that people in this room are going through all different seasons right now? You know, the summer people judging the winter people. Well, your turn's coming, summer people. (laughs) That's why the Bible says, Romans 12, celebrate with those who celebrate and weep with those who weep. It's a continual cycle, you know, that the actual people who are being encouraged, uh, the summer people encouraging the winter people, it actually works the other way around. When the cycle comes around, we're meant to be encouraging those uh, people as well. So don't assume that everybody in this room is going through the same season as you. You know, don't say everybody is thinking. Everybody is feeling. No, only the winter people are thinking that. You know, so let's just understand that there's just this cycle and respect the fact that people are going through seasons um, and that this is not God's punishment. It says uh, in uh, Hebrews 12, this trouble you're in isn't punishment. It's training, the normal experience of children. That's not a fridge magnet you're going to get from Karong. You're not going to buy that one. You go, oh, I'll have that one. Oh, yes. This trouble, I'm going, no, you're not going to get that. But it's just needed that we understand that, okay? This trouble isn't punishment. It's training, the normal experience. Seasoned people get that. They understand that. Number three, come on, like you're bringing up, no, no, all right, no season lasts forever, so no matter what season you're in right now, prepare for the next, oh yes, all right, so if you're in the emptiness of winter, Now is not the time to give up in despair because as surely as God has ordained season, your springtime is coming. So no matter what season you're in right now, prepare for the next. And you might be saying, well, you know what? I thought I'd be a lot further advanced in my journey towards my destiny by now. It just seems to be taking so long for me to, there's a dream that's been in my heart for, for so many years and yet I just seem so far away from it becoming a reality. Well, that's because God does not lead us in leaps. He takes us in steps. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You, you're not going to get on an escalator and just get taken there. God's going to take you to your destiny in steps. You need to understand that there's the wisdom of God in that because here's your calling, but right now here's your character. And so God is going to take you in steps so that by the time you're totally released to your destiny, your character is going to match your calling. Right now, if you were to be elevated straight to your destiny, you'd be dangerous. You wouldn't last long. But God, in his wisdom, takes us there in steps. And now, finally, we come to why I've called this message, Don't Chop Down Your Peach Tree in Wintertime. My wife says, I don't tell enough stories when I preach, so here's a story. Uh, (laughs) I snuck one in finally to to meet her uh, criteria. Uh, So we, my wife and I actually grew up in tropical North Queensland. And so I was 30 years old before I saw a real live peach tree. All right, I mean, I'd eaten peaches, but never seen a peach tree. So we moved to uh, Victoria, country Victoria, and there in our backyard is a peach tree. But Autumn comes and all the leaves turn yellow and fall off. Well, this is a tropical North Queensland boy. And when a tree looks like this, let's have the peach tree up there. I mean, that's dead. To a North Queenslander, that's a dead tree. 
There's no life there. That's like, chop that baby down. That's, it's all over. Something's happened. You know, let's kill that thing. All right. So I'm looking at it thinking, wow, gee, it's dead. But at least I went to see the neighbor first and talked. And he said, no, 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 it's not dead. It's dormant. It's not dead. It's dormant. He said, now, you'll really regret it if you chop that down. Because that tree is getting ready for another season of fruitfulness. It's pulled all of its energy back into itself and it's going to be covered with blossoms in spring and fruit in uh, summer. And I'm so glad I didn't chop it down because he was right. It was incredible watching this thing spring back into life again. So what am I saying? Don't chop down your peach tree. The promise of God that you've been waiting for, it looks dead, but it's not. It's dormant. It's just dormant. And you, if you go around chopping down that peach tree promise with your words and actions and behavior, you'll regret it. you regret it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't be tempted to think this is dead, it's gone, it's finished, it's all over. It could be a relational thing, it could be your business, it could be your finance, but you were given a promise. Don't think that God has forsaken you. It's not dead, it's just dormant. Don't chop down that relationship or that situation uh, with the words of your mouth. Don't act hastily. Believe, prepare, and trust God because it's surely as the cycle seasons are in nature, so your new season will come in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask the singers and musicians to come back and help us. And we're going to go back into singing that song that we were singing earlier about new wine. It's such an applicable um, song that really we're going to convert into a prayer. You can sing it, but I, I think the impact of it is going to be if you pray it to God. In the context of the teaching that you've just heard, the understanding of season, maybe today has been such an instrumental moment in your life where you, you're rocked up and you're, you're all, all ready to chop something down, a promise to give up on it. But God put this word in my mouth in this Kairos moment for you, don't do it. It's not dead, it's just dormant. Come on, believe, trust, wait. Surely the promise of God will come to pass. Why don't we stand and let's yield our hearts afresh as we just pray this back to God and just position ourselves again.